Hey friends, it's Devin here with Make Anything. And if you have a 3D printer, chances are you've spent some time tinkering around with it and trying to get the cleanest, smoothest prints possible. Today, however, I kind of want to explore the exact opposite by adding texture to our 3D prints and hopefully making them look better in the process. Now, there are ways to add texture using your 3D printer with special slicer settings, and I will get into that a bit later in this video. But first, I want to focus on some techniques that come from the 3D pen world and show you how they can be handy when it comes to 3D printing. Basically, we're going to be remelting our prints in a very controlled and artful fashion to get a level of texture and detail that FDM 3D printing alone just couldn't achieve. I already tried this a bit in a recent short where I textured this untitled goose. It worked out pretty great and people seem to like it, but the goose kind of got away. So today we're going to make this cute capybara. And thanks to the techniques I'll share, we're going to print this in multiple parts without any support material and still end up with this wonderful seamless model. While it's not perfect for every print, I think this is a really cool trick that you should know. So let's get to it. Cool. To start off, we need to download our Capybara model. I found this on Thingiverse, uploaded by Yahoo Japan, apparently. Anyways, it's a nice model and it should work perfectly for this demo. So let's download the STL file and bring it into Microsoft 3D Builder. 3D Builder is a great free tool for simple STL manipulation. This model's pretty tiny, so we'll scale it up by 250% and then we can figure out how to split up our model into multiple pieces so that we can print it more easily. So I'm gonna drag the capybara down into the ground plane just so we can start to visualize cut planes. If we just cut straight through like this and imagine flipping that bottom half to print it from the flat surface up, we would already be able to print both parts without support material by avoiding any serious overhangs, but we would be cutting right through the face which isn't ideal. We can try rotating the model, which fixes that problem, but then the overhang from these feet could likely cause a failure. So in this case, it's tricky to pull off with a single cut. So let's just do two cuts. We'll select the split tool, set it to keep both sides, and move the plane to make our first cut. I'll angle it slightly to reduce the overhangs on those feet, and then confirm the split. Now we'll just do a second split to separate the head into its own section. If we color each part, we can visualize the pieces, and I'll deselect all but one piece so we can go to the Object tab and select Settle. That drops our part flat on the ground so it's ready to print. Now let's select the head and settle that as well. And then we'll flip the feet and do the same. You can see how we just managed to keep the overhang here at about 45 degrees, so it should print no problem. With that, we've got our three printable parts, and now we can delete all but one at a time to save as individual STL files. After saving one, just undo to get back the other parts, and repeat. Don't worry buddy, soon you'll be whole once more. I'm printing these parts on my new Sovel SV01 Pro 3D printer at 0.16mm layer height using this lovely Spidermaker 3D matte PLA. I love the flat look of this filament, and it's the perfect color for our capybara. Now that our parts are printed, it's time to join them. Oftentimes, I'll do that with my 3D pen using the same material, which works great, but in this case, I'm gonna use super glue since we have these large flat surfaces and I just wanna make sure they're as flush as possible. This glue is very thin, so it won't push the material apart. It also takes a few seconds to cure, so we can shift things around a bit until it's perfectly aligned. After that's dry, we'll do the same with the head. All right, our capybara is reassembled. It's a miracle. Now it's time to add our texture by remelting the plastic. I'll be using this old 3DCMO Mini, 
which can function as a wood burning tool as well as a soldering iron, and those are the main choices I'd go with for this technique. By now I wouldn't actually recommend this brand because you can get a good wood burning tool and a soldering iron for less than this multi-tool, and there are better 3D pens out there by now that make this kind of obsolete in my opinion. If you're looking for a good 3D pen, I really like the Mint 3D pens. But today we're just using the burning tools, so this will do just fine. Now before we get back to our capybara, I printed this little icosahedron so we can try out different textures and explore what's possible with these tools. We'll start out with the wood burning tip. I like it because this chisel shape gives us a lot of different edges and surfaces to melt our print with. I've been using temperatures between 325 and 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Higher temps do risk burning the plastic, but I wanna work fast, so I'll start on that high end. I'll also place this HEPA filter right near our part, since melting plastic will release some fumes, and that's something I generally try to avoid breathing in. All right, time to have some fun and come up with a bunch of textures. I'll start out with the one I used on my goose and plan on using for the capybara which is basically a bunch of quick, short, consecutive strokes, which in this case will resemble animal hair. Yeah, this is a rather time-consuming process. Unlike 3D printing, it's very hands-on and more akin to sketching on paper. You also have to feel things out in terms of how much pressure to apply and how quickly to work, but it's mostly just an act of patience. I actually find it quite relaxing, but I know that's not the case for everyone. There's one triangle. Let's move to another, and this time I'll do the same thing but with shorter strokes to get a more fuzzy look. When I started this next one, I did get some burnt plastic on there, so it's a good idea to keep a damp paper towel or sponge handy to wipe off the tip every now and then and keep it clean. Here I did some long, continuous strokes with the edge of the tool. This could be a nice look for human hair, or just an abstract texture for a miniature wall, or a brushed metal look, maybe. Of course, we don't have to stick to straight lines. Here I used the pointy tip to draw little swoops and create this fleece-like texture. Or maybe it's the surface of a small lake, you know? Get creative with it. For this one, instead of pulling strokes, I just smudged the tip into the plastic to create these little scales. Actually, this could have worked for my goose feathers as well. While I did say we're adding texture today, it is technically possible to smooth away your layer lines as well. I mean, when it comes to 3D printing, I don't know if you'd call this smooth per se, but it kind of does look like smoothed out clay to me. Next, I did some wild hatching. Just a bunch of quick light scratches in every direction to obscure the layers of our print. Or we can do slower, deep lines that move more material and create some pretty intense texture. Here I did some deep swirls for another dramatic look. All right, I think it's a good time to swap out the wood burning tool for this soldering iron. This tool has a nice narrow cone tip that's great for poking. So let's start out with some pointillism. We'll just pack the surface with tiny little dots to create this uniform texture. This one definitely takes the longest, but it would probably look good on a lot of surfaces. The fine tip also lets us just draw onto the surface, so there's really infinite textures to be made. I've always liked this bubble texture or chameleon skin. We can also draw scales in the same way or maybe some long, wavy lines. All right, look away if you have trypophobia, but I can already see this technique being used to make some awesome little suction cups for an octopus. I tried cross-hatching with the soldering tip as well. It's messy, but quick. These deep strokes look really cool. Maybe it could simulate some tiny roof tiles. Then some more dots, just cause it's fun to do. And finally, I combined a few strokes to make this metal panel type surface. So there we have at least 18 different textures that you can make with this technique. 
And that's certainly not the limit, so I'd love to see what else you all come up with. But for now, let's get back to our capybara. As you can see, there's already some texture on her, but we can definitely step things up with our burning tools. Once again, I'm working at 400 degrees Fahrenheit because we have a lot of surface area to cover here. And I'll get started with those quick medium strokes to try to mimic the coarse hair of a capybara. I like to start on the bottom, just because I'm still warming up, so I'd rather mess up down here. But luckily, things were going well right off the bat. You can already see how well the hairs cover up these areas that have some pretty visible layer stepping. But one of the greatest things is how easily we can obscure the seams between our parts. It's pretty much just a matter of continuing the pattern over those areas. Again, we definitely want good ventilation because this might take a couple hours. This area under the neck had a slight gap between the parts, but I was still able to cover it up pretty easily. Also, note that I'm doing my best to follow the direction of the hair grain that an actual capybara would have. I did have a bit of help with the original model since the print does indicate that a bit, but it's still something to keep in mind. Under the feet, I decided to try that smoothing technique, though clearly I failed to clean the tip enough beforehand. Luckily, well, it's the bottom of the feet, so I guess it only adds to the realism, really. Now I will clean the tip before working on the head, and I'm also gonna lower the temperature to 325 degrees so we can do some more delicate work. You can see the difference that makes here with the lines being more thin and crisp. In hindsight, I probably should have transitioned between the temperatures more slowly, but it did help a lot when it came to the small parts like the ears and the eyes. This model doesn't actually have much of an ear canal, so I took the opportunity to add one with the burner. Once the area is warmed up, you can really push the plastic around and model in some completely new details. So that's pretty cool. Here's a close-up of the eye where I used really short strokes around these features as an actual capybara probably would have. Cool, that's it for the wood burner. Our capybara is now covered with hair from head to toe and our seams are pretty well hidden. Now, while I don't wanna to do too much more post-processing, I do think the eyes would look much nicer with some black gloss. So I'll be using this testers enamel paint. First, I used an alcohol wipe to clean off any hand oils that might be on there. It did string off quite a bit, so I pulled those off. And then to apply the paint, I'm just gonna use the bare end of a Q-tip snipped to a point. That just saves me the pain of cleaning a brush. So I'll do one eye and then give it several minutes to dry before I flip it over and do the other eye. I did use a bit too much paint on this side and those hairs we added seem to wick the paint a bit. So our capybara might be wearing some mascara, but she's rocking it. Awesome. I think this is a very lovely hairy capybara and it certainly looks like one piece. So I'd call this a success. Now, I did mention that you can also add texture from within your slicer, and I was specifically referring to a setting called Fuzzy Skin within Cura. Let's explore this setting a bit here in Cura because it's been around for years and I've honestly never used it. So I've just got this small sample tile and I'll search for the Fuzzy Skin option under the Experimental tab. Ooh. Select that and we get a handful of other options. If we just slice the default settings, we can see that the outer skin is suddenly bumpy. The greater we make this fuzzy skin thickness, the further it deviates from the actual outline. You can get pretty crazy with it, so I've printed out several versions to see how they translate to real life. Once again, I'm printing on my SV01 Pro, and we can use my Pro Blends to get a really good look at the action. It's pretty erratic. It almost looks like a mistake, but it works. Here's a three millimeter thickness, which still printed fine. So I went all the way up to six millimeters and the printer still managed. Apparently you can 3D print Wheaties. Who knew? So here are the samples I printed out at different settings and 
Well, they look like they'd make fine grass, don't they? Just what my capybara needs, a nice lawn to stand on. I printed this up using the three millimeter fuzzy skin. I'm using Matterhacker's Build PLA here and some more Spider Maker Craft Brown PLA for this border. The grass warped a tiny bit, so there is a gap, but with that fuzzy skin, it pretty much disappears from an angle. So for now, I'll just drop everything in place and what a lovely scene. Just that little bit of extra color and context really adds to this piece. Maybe I'll finish it up a bit more in the future, but for now, I'm happy with it. Yeah, you're a wonderful capybara. And there we have it. Our fuzzy capybara now has some fuzzy grass to graze upon. Of course, as you saw in my little icosahedron demo, there's a lot more we can do with this technique. So I'd love to hear your ideas. What models and textures will you try? Let me know in the comments below. Or better yet, join the Make Anything Discord community and share your results. All right, that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Take care, and as always, stay inspired.